joining us here in person or online, we want to say welcome. We're so excited you came to join us for worship. And isn't it great when we get together on God's day? Amen? Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. I, I missed it. I missed it. So good to be back. All right. We've got an exciting service today, including a baptism. So I'm going to slip on in the back and get ready for that. But let's, uh, let's worship this morning. All right, we turn to hymn number 426. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Savior. Amen. Hannah, 
Do you believe that God, uh, that Jesus is God's one and only Son, that He was born of a virgin, that He suffered and died on the cross for our sins, that He was buried and raised three days later? Yes. And we baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.
this time.
Well, just let me remind you, as someone reminded me, it has been four weeks since I preached. So it's not that I've forgotten how, it's that it's all been building up. So get ready. Buckle in. We have one verse this morning, so it shouldn't take us more than a couple hours to get through it. You laugh now. I'm kidding, of course. As I said, the title is the Call, the Struggle, and the Joy of Worshiping Together. That's actually going to be our outline for this morning. We're going to look at each one of those separately. The call that we have to worship together, the struggle that we have in worshiping together, and then the joy that we have of worshiping together. But before we dive in, I'm going to go ahead and give you the main point of today's sermon. Here it is. God has called us to sacrificially worship Him together and to love one another as a family. So that's what we're going to see in today's text. And you might say, wow, that's a lot from just this one verse. But we're going to expound and expand on that some. Let's look at the call that we have this morning. Now we know that Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And that is a beautiful and wonderful promise that when we gather together in God's name, He is there with us. Amen. We know He's here this morning because we have gathered in His name. And there's obviously more than two or three of us here. God's Word is never wrong. And Jesus never lied. So that we know when we come together on Sunday mornings, on Wednesdays, on Sunday nights, or any other time, when we gather in His name, He is with us. It's a wonderful and a beautiful promise. We know that the early church met together. It said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It was a normal thing for the early church to gather together to listen to the preaching and the teaching of the apostles and to gather together in fellowship and to share a meal. And this is what we Baptists love, that part of the, the, the verse. That's why potlucks are <coughs> biblical, okay? It's in God's Word. You can't refute it. But they would gather together and they would pray. And the indication here is that that's not a one-time thing. That was a regular thing that they did often. It was a routine thing that they would gather together. Now, they weren't sitting around together throughout the entire week. They weren't ignoring their families or their jobs or, or, or all the other things going on in the world. That's not what it says. But they did take time out of their days, out of their weeks, to come together together. As a group, as a fellowship, as a church, to worship, to study, to hear His Word preached. And more directly, we know that God desires and instructs us to meet together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. We see a call from the Lord for us to gather together. He has called us to be in community. To be a part, to worship Him corporately as well as individually. Now if you're wondering where do we see this call in this one verse we just read, that's a good question. Now, we can think of it logically, and while we don't see a direct imperative to, to gather together, we know the call here is to love one another. This call is found in the context of the local body, the local church. 
Obviously, if we're called to love one another, that implies that we're going to be around one another, right? So if you're a hermit and you live far, far away from anybody, you barely ever see anybody, and you read this verse, love one another, you might look around and go, check, that was easy. The implication is we're going to be together, we're going to see each other, we need to love one another. And you might say, well, he could mean in the context of going about our normal day. How many of you run into somebody from church at the grocery store? Right? Happens all the time. We see each other. We see other people that, that go to other churches. We see brothers and sisters in Christ everywhere we go. He could say, we need to love each other as we're going about our day. This is true. We should do that. But again, that's not what Paul is saying here. So to understand and not take this verse out of context, we're going to jump back and look at verse 1. So we can get a full understanding of what he means. So join me there. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, this first passage of chapter 12, the main focus is our relationship with the Lord, right? Being a living sacrifice, submitting to His will, and following in obedience to Him, no matter what. So we see that at the beginning. He then turns his attention, look at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ. What's he talking about here? He's talking about... The church and individual members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of faith. If service in service, if in teaching in teaching, if in exhorting in exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul has set up this passage. Look, give your life. To God as a living sacrifice. And then use the gifts that he has given you to be a part and to serve in the local church. He then immediately turns his attention to loving one another. So in the context of this passage, this call to love one another is set in the local church. He says, verse 9, Love must be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, and outdo one another in showing honor. So Paul, in this call for us to love one another, means that in the local body of Christ setting, as a church, As a family. Now, what kind of love does he mean? When you look at this in the Greek, you want to want, does anyone want to take a guess at which word for love we find here? Agape. An agape love, a God like love, a sacrificial love, an unconditional love. <clears throat> he says this love must be without hypocrisy. Now, he's not using the word hypocrite as we would think of a hypocrite. In, in Greek uh, times, they would have theater, and, and the actors would use masks to cover their face, and they would portray the emotions of their characters, right? And that was the term for hypocrite. So the idea of 
saying one thing and doing another is not really captured here. It's more of someone who is acting as though, uh, acting one way, but not really feeling that way. Your character might be in anguish, right? But is that person really in anguish? No. No. So when he says, love must be without hypocrisy. It must not be a fake love. It must be a genuine love. Don't put on a mask and pretend to love one another. But we're really good at that, aren't we? We're really good at coming in and putting on a mask and pretending that life is different than what it really is. The call is to love one another genuinely, unconditionally, sacrificially, with an agape kind of love. As I was studying this, I was reading in one of the commentaries, the Tyndall commentary, and I found a profound, profound statement in there. He was beginning at the beginning of a passage. He says, Doctrine is never taught in the Bible simply that it may be known. Amen. It is taught in order that it may be translated into practice. How many of you know that we are called to love one another? Right? Jesus told his disciples, a new command I give you, to love one another. And he said, this is the way that the world will know that you are my disciples. That you love one another. We know that call. But the Bible is telling us, the Bible is bringing this up, the Bible is speaking this to us, not so we just know that, but, because, but so that we do that. Love one another. Show honor to one another. Outdo each other in that. And so we look at the struggle, because the truth is, that can be hard. That could be very, very hard. How many of you have struggled to love your spouse at one time or another? <laughs> Some not brave people not raising their hands. <laughs> or some very wise husbands, I can't tell. <laughs> It can be a struggle to love even the people that we are closest with. And why? Because people are sinful. Paul's already written in Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are sinful. All of us are messy. People can be selfish. People can be arrogant. People can be hypocritical. People can be just downright mean. And I'm just talking about the people I live with. <laughs> we live in a fallen and a sinful world. We live where, where people are out for themselves. And when you think about our culture, that's the image it's selling, right? Obey your thirst. Have it your way. Look out for number one. Our culture is perpetuating a selfish, centered, self-centered image. It is about me and my happiness. And when we meet people like that, when we see people like that, when we interact with people like that, it can be difficult to love that person. But you know, the flip side of that is true. It can be difficult to love a person who is sinful, but it can be difficult to love someone because I'm sinful, because I'm selfish, because I'm prideful, because I'm arrogant, because of me, me, me. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he said this, 
Here's a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. Think of that for a second. Paul, amazing man of faith, wrote 13 books that we know of in the New Testament, says he is the worst sinner. How dare we think that we are not sinful? Remember, a very wise pastor was preaching one day, and in his sermon he told the story of after preaching a sermon on sin, a gentleman came up and said, I want you to know that I haven't sinned in 15 years. And the pastor just ignored him and he began to look around. And the man got a little agitated and said, Pastor, didn't you hear me? I haven't sinned in 15 years. What do you think of that? And the pastor said, well, give me just a second. I'm looking for your wife. <laughs> See, this is where sacrifice comes in. People are messy. People are sinful. People are selfish. Of which I am the worst. To love someone like that with an agape love takes sacrifice. It takes laying down our life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. An unknown quote was written or excuse me, a quote was written by an unknown author. So the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. And no matter how good we might be doing today or this week, Satan's always there to throw a wrench in tomorrow. It can be a struggle for us to love one another. And so many people use that as the excuse and the reason to leave church and to not worship together anymore. Guys, if you're looking, and I see some visitors here, if you're looking for the perfect church, please go find it. Because it's not here. Right? When I was in seminary, a pastor told us, uh, those of us who are going to be a pastor or those who are going to serve in a church, he said, if you ever find the perfect church, don't go there. Because you're a sinner and you'll screw it up. <laughs> there is no perfect church. But there is the body of Christ that God has called us to sacrificially serve and to love one another with a Christ-like love. Well, I don't love that person. You know how they treated me? That's not an agape love. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not very happy with them. Did you know what they said? Or did you know what they did? Or do you know what they picked? That's not an agape love. That's a conditional love. I'll love you. I'll, I'll be with you. I'll support you. Unless you do something I don't like. That's a terrible approach to the body of Christ. And unfortunately, we have presented this consumeristic understanding of churches in America. Oh, you don't like that person? They made you upset? Instead of going to them, instead of, uh, of, of resolving the issue, instead of finding restoration, instead of bringing correction or rebuke when we need it, instead of practicing uh, church discipline, well, I don't want to do that. I'll just go pick from the hundred other churches in my area. And it's easy for us <coughs> to just run away. Instead of dealing and being edified. I've used this example before, but there was a brother who I upset one time. Instead of leaving, he came. He 
said, Brother, I want you to know you upset me. I'm so sorry. What did I do? We sat down. We talked about it. And you know what? We grew closer because of it. It's a struggle. It's a sacrifice. But it is worth it. Let's look at the joy that we have. You know, oftentimes we forget that church is a gift. This local body of Christ here is a gift. God has blessed my life with you. And I'm so thankful that I'm a part of it. We know that every good and pleasing gift is from above, coming from our Father. It's easy, forget, easy for us to forget and we begin to look at church not as a gift, but as a chore. As something that's difficult for us to do. Something we don't want to do. Something we have to drag ourselves to. Remember that church is a gift. And one that brings joy. Let's look for just a moment. What do you get when you come to church? You get a family. Love one another with brotherly affection. What he means by brotherly affection is as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we come in, that's what we are. We are a family. We are a church family. I know that has become a moniker for many people. I know that has become a moniker for many churches. Hey, family. But I mean that. We're a family. We are a family. I don't say that lightly. This church means so much to me and to my wife and to my kids. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there, there's so many of y'all that I can count on, so many of y'all that I could call an emergency, so many that would be there for us no matter what. And I hope you know the same is true for me and the same is true for others in this congregation. Before he passed away, Bob told me how much this church meant to him. Now, Bob had a family. Bob had a daughter, but she lived away. And it didn't take anything away from his daughter or his family, his blood family. He had a family right here in Morgan's Point. We loved him, and he loved us. You get a family when you come to church. You get a family when you join together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know what happens with families? Do you know what happens with families on vacation? <laughs> they get a little frustrated with each other, right? Everything might be going smooth sailing that first mile or two, but you get to that third mile... You've got kids screaming in the back seat, mom's upset, dad's frustrated, they're ready to pull the car and turn over and turn around and head back home, right? Yeah. But you don't. You don't give up on family. Even though there are people that can frustrate you. You get a family that's committed to one another, and that is a wonderful and a joyful thing. I enjoy going to other churches and getting to worship with them, and in the broader sense, in the, in, in the more global sense, they are my brothers and sisters as well, and one day, we're all going to be up in heaven, and we're not going to be like, okay, if you were part of Fellowship Baptist Church, you're over here in this part of heaven, and if you're part of First Baptist Church, Belton, you're over in there, and that's, we're not going to be divided, we're going to be all together. And it's wonderful to go to another church and to see that. But it's still not like coming home to my church family that know me, that love me, and that miss me. At least some go. <laughs> Kidding. When I come out of the service, whether it's a Sunday or a Sunday evening or a Wednesday night, and I'm locking up the church and I see people out in the parking lot, and they're just talking and they're visiting and they're, they're hanging out. And I might joke, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> That's so wonderful to see. To see family getting along together. It echoes 
the psalmist said in Psalms 133.1, how good and pleasing it is when brothers dwell together in unity. There's joy in gathering together because we are a family. But there's also joy because we get God's love manifested in His people. The foundation of all of this, the foundation of this agape love we're called to is with our relationship with the Lord. That's why Paul began this chapter with sacrifice. Giving your life to the Lord. Following in obedience to Him. Not being conformed to the world, but being transformed to the image of His Son. You see, the reason we know what love is, is because of God. It's because of our Lord Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. Paul's already written in this book. He says, but God shows His love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have anything to offer. We didn't have anything to give. We didn't have anything to bring that would benefit God's family. But God loved us in an agape way, in an unconditional way, in a sacrificial way. And He gave His Son to die on a cross for you and for me. The only reason we know what love is is because of Jesus on the cross the only reason we have the ability to love others this way is because of Him, His love in us. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because He first loved us. Now, how many of y'all remember the fruits of the Spirit? Right? A few of y'all, all right, all right. Is it a coconut? No. No, it's not a coconut. Is it a banana? No. No, it's not a banana. Not any of the other fruits. I'm not going to go through the whole song. What's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. 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 We can love because of the love He has given us. Inside. Church is a gift. And a joyful one because we get a family, because we get God's love manifested in His people. And just a side note to this that means also church is a great training ground, church is a great edifier. Because if you want to learn how to love somebody with an agape love, there is no better place than church. Church should be a place where we learn and we grow to love people. We're going to get on each other's nerves. We're going to get frustrated with each other. We're going to make decisions that we don't like. We're going to have personalities that conflict with one another. And through all of those things, we are called to love one another. In spite of those differences, in spite of those struggles, in spite of those So we get a family, we get God's love manifested in His people, and we also see God's, we God pleased. Anytime we trust in Him and follow in obedience, our Heavenly Father is pleased. Anytime we come and we do the hard thing of loving someone who is difficult to love, we are the most Christ-like than we can be. Now, don't misunderstand me. Because some people will think to love means to let go. That's not true. Sometimes it is. But sometimes the most important thing love can do is to correct, to edify, to rebuke. And sometimes love can be the hardest thing that we're called to do. It's tough to sit down with someone to point out something they've done wrong. And we don't like to do it, right? Because when you point out someone who's uh, point something out to someone who's doing something wrong, generally what's their first reaction? Boy, that was great. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. 
I love you so much. Let me ask you. A true friend, a true brother, a true sister, someone you truly love, you see them about to walk off a cliff. And they're going with full determination. Nothing's going to change their mind. Do you step back and go, well, they made up their mind? Or do you do the hard thing, step in front of them, get in their face, and say, this is wrong. That's not going to lead to anything good. That's going to take you someplace you don't want to go. That's going to result in an end you don't want to meet. When we trust God. When we love others with a sacrificial love. When we point others to Him and always Him, leading others to sacrifice their life and to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. God looks at that and God is pleased. turn our attention real quickly as we close here. 1 John chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 is our church verse if you don't know it. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. Now listen to verse 4. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Guys, it's great being back. I love seeing your faces. I love getting to worship with my family. I love getting to meet new people, guests, and visitors when they come. But I want you to take a moment and I want you to look around for just a moment. And notice not Who's here, but who's not here? Who do we need to bring in that our joy may be complete? Who do we need to encourage that they might come back and join us? Who do we need to share that love of Christ with, maybe for the first time, so they put their faith and their trust in Him, so they can join together in true fellowship with us? Who is it in your life that's missing that you desire desperately would be here? Is it a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, a family member? Who is it that we're praying for? Who is it that we're striving for? Who is it that we're loving with an agape love so that they can see that the one and only hope that we have in this life is Jesus Christ? Who's missing? Who do we need to bring in? Our joy to be complete. God has called us to sacrificial work, uh, to sacrificially worship Him together through the thick and through the thin and to love one another as a family. When someone in my family can't make it, my brother's in the Navy, my, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband's in the Air Force, when we have a holiday and we get together, and invariably there's times where one or some of them can't be there, we get together, it's still a wonderful time, but you know what we do? We look around and we say, gosh, I wish they could be here. Gosh, I wish they could celebrate with us. Gosh, I wish we could have a meal together. Gosh, I wish we could hang out with each other. Who's missing today? Who's missing in our church? If you look around, we've got plenty of space. We've got room on the pews. We've got plenty of reason to invite others. It's a great and a wonderful day to come back to church, to worship together. And I want to thank you those who've come and maybe those who've come back and maybe those who haven't gone here before who are guests or a visitor, but to our members, those who are missing, who would make our joy? I'm going to give you a chance to respond. Please stand if you will.
The altar is open if you'd like to pray for someone, if you'd like to pray for yourself, if God is calling you to something, you come. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'd love to. But as He calls, will you come? Dismissed. Oh, victory.